for the next oh nine months, I went on what I call scorched earth. Okay. So for nine months after that, I went on a, a solid campaign of personal societal destruction of if you liked me, I was going to offend you. Whatever that was that you could, that I could offend you with, I was going to do that. It was like conscious. Like I would figure out what you liked, figure out how to break our relationship and do that. And I, I did that with everybody close to me. And in that process, I even went to every family member I could, charmed my way in, got into every picture album I could possibly get into, gathered every picture of me and got them in a pile and burned them. I was trying to annihilate my past. So currently there's maybe five or six pictures that exist of me before the age of 16. Wow. And the, so I, I would, if, if after nine months of that, of solid social devastation of offending and being mean and vicious to everybody I'm around and trying to destroy every bit of support I possibly have, I am now completely alone. I am I even ruined my relationship with Mike or I thought because I had stolen a bunch of two long boxes worth of his comics, took it to a comic shop and sold them. And Whoa. yeah, I was trying to break our relationship. And so after nine months of that, I'm now completely alone and I'm in the field buying Casa Bonita. And I hadn't changed my clothes in months, hadn't taken my shoes off in months, but I also wasn't wearing socks. My feet were literally rotting off of my body. I was surviving by stealing food and free samples from the Albertsons at the top of the group, but next to Casa Bonita and trying to avoid police during the daytime. The, um, I, I was just absolutely at the bottom and I woke up one morning in the snow and it was like two inches of snow on the ground and the two block walk to get up from the hit from the field to the grocery store. I wasn't just shaking. I was seizing. I was like, I can't breathe. I, I, my arms are twitching. I can't barely move. I barely can make it up there. And I get into the bathroom to kind of wash my face off. I look in the mirror and I'm like, I got to do something or I'm going to die. This, this is the bottom. If I don't get help, I'm going to die. And across the street from the school that I was nominally at had to be at North because uh, the, well, if you weren't at on school campus, the truancy officers would arrest you, but I never actually attended school. Only classes right. I ever attended were choir class and English class. So afterwards, if you ask me about that, I'll tell you why. Um, but so I, across the street from that, there was a building that said mental health. And I didn't know what it was for. I didn't know what it was about. I just knew it said mental health. And I knew that when the last time when I warned them I was coming, they brought my mom in. I'm not doing that shit again. So this time I'm just going to go in cold. So I went in. And I tried to get some help. And they had me meet with this young lady. She was in her early 20s. And I don't really remember much about that conversation. Because all I remember is the very end. When she said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. I can't help you. And when I walked out of that door, that moment is where I felt my brain break. I felt my brain snap like a mirror. Like literally felt like shards of glass. And right, right one after another, a couple things instantly happened. It was like bang, bang, bang immediate effects. The first was I found out what was at the bottom of that giant tsunami. When you're at the bottom of all of that mosh pit, it gets really quiet and it gets really still because there's nothing left to lose. There's no more down. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to cut my arm off. Okay. I'm going to die. You put me in jail. They'll feed me. Like I don't have any more down. And so right then the pr plans crystallized right in my head. I knew what I was going to do because I had talked it through with the disaster group of friends. I had already talked through the plans. All I right. was either going to go into the school food court or the mall food court. Like I had already walked through the details of what I was going to do. And I knew where to get a gun because this was mid nineties. This was get boys in the hood era. So gangs were a big thing. And this was before the age of metal detectors. So kids would routinely bring in pistols and flash them in school and stuff. Like it was just a thing. Wow. And yeah, the mid nineties were a crazy time. And there was a bunch of gangbangers that bought and sold drugs from my family that would hang out next to the ROTC building at the end of the school. It was right actually next to the entry doors I was planning on going into. And they knew me, they they knew my family, and I went up to them like, Hey dude, can you give me a gun? Hopefully one that shoots a lot of bullets. Like, yeah, dude, give me an ounce of weed. Okay. That was easy enough to do because I went to my mom's house, grabbed an ounce out of the druggies fucking pants sleeping on her floor. My, one of my brother's friends, he had three of them bagged up, grabbed an ounce out of his pocket, took it to him and gave it to him. Here you go. He's like, all right, give me, a, give me three days. I'll get that for you. Okay. 
And that all happened in one afternoon. Like I went to him, went home, grabbed it, came back. Here you go. And so it was like, give me, give me three days. I'll get that for you. I'm like, okay, cool. And so in three days time, I was planning on getting a gun. And I was pretty sure I was going to get it. The dude wasn't going to flake out. He was a student. Like he wasn't going to, wasn't some rando I met off the street. Like, right. I, it, so it, in that time frame, I, I didn't think about it then, but looking back, I think I was saying goodbye. I was going to people in a much calmer way. And like, I went to my ex-girlfriend and told her, thank you for letting me sleep outside your gravel, outside your window. And I was going to friends' houses and just saying, thanks for keeping me alive. And I, at the end of that, I went to Mike's house and I knocked on his door. And when I knocked on his door and he opened it, I was in tears and he brought me in and he sat me. No problem. He brought me in, sat me down, gave me some food. Um, and he treated me like I was a person when I felt absolutely inhuman. And it wasn't, it wasn't hanging out with a buddy that saved my life. It was that when I knocked on his door, I didn't just feel invisible. I felt erased. I felt gone. I felt right. like I was just a, a walking void that was about ready to explode. And that was it. And I was just trying to close off my life, write the thank you notes in the bottom last chapter of my book, close the chat, close the lid and be done. And so he brought me in and it was like putting the tiny bits of me back on the bottom shelf of my life. And it was, I, the, it was like, I was able to take a breath and like the waves receded a bit and it really, it, it helped kind of reestablish my connection with me. And so, yeah, that, that I didn't leave his house for a week. I, I never went and got the gun and he's still my best friend today.